All right, hello everyone. And thank you for joining us for succession planning with Tom Frank, Executive Vice President and Northern California Regional Manager for Whittier Trust San Francisco. Whittier Trust offers a wide variety of financial services and expertise supported by an exceptional commitment to personal service reflecting their family office roots. They collaborate closely with their clients and their advisors to tailor investment strategies that meets clients' unique needs, goals, and values. In other words, focusing on the individual definition of what wealth means to their client. We are so grateful that you are here, Tom. We are also joined today by Susan Noyes, founder and publisher of Make It Better Media Group. Susan will be introducing Tom and facilitating the Q&A portion of our presentation. My name is Natasha. I am the marketing manager here at Make It Better Media Group, and I'll be the woman behind the curtains today helping to moderate the event. If you have any technical questions, please feel free to reach out to me via the chat located on the right side of your screen. There's also the Q&A tab where you can submit your questions for the Q&A portion of our event. We're excited to hear from you. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Susan, who will introduce Tom. Thank you so much, Natasha. And I wanna second her suggestion and request that as you have questions that pop up, please send them because we want to address them during the Q&A section. Um, Tom Frank is the Executive Vice President, Northern California Regional Manager in Whittier's Trust San Francisco office. He, is, as you have heard, he is responsible for managing complex client relationships, including investments, planning, and family dynamics and fiduciary services, as well as all operations, revenue, staff, and other elements related to the Northern California region. That's a big job and he does it beautifully. Tom brings over 30 years of experience in comprehensive family office services, including investment consulting, banking, trust and fiduciary, family education and financial administration for high net worth clients. His most recent position was director of relationship management with Abbott Downing, formerly Wells Fargo Family Wealth in San Francisco. Tom's prior experience includes various positions at Bessemer Trust, including Managing Director, Head of Client Account Administration, Managing Director, Senior President, Senior Resident Officer, West Coast Head, Senior Vice President, and Vice President. Previous employers also include DLJ Asset Management and U.S. Trust. Tom earned his JD from Brooklyn Law School and a bachelor's degree in foreign service from Georgetown University. I think he must have interesting stories to tell. He is a member of the California Bar Association and the New York Bar Association. Tom is a registered trust and estate practitioner. He is also the director of the San Francisco Estate Planning Council, a past trustee of the Marillac Academy a school in San Francisco's Tenderloin District serving the needs of at-risk children and was a volunteer mentor with Big Brothers Big Sisters. I am really looking forward to hearing from you, Tom. Susan and Natasha, thank you very much for that warm welcome. Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be here and, and thank you very much for tuning in today. I'm a resident of Marin and a longtime reader of Marin Magazine, and so I'm thrilled to be able to share with you some of the experience that I've gleaned in working with wealthy families over the past 30 some odd years as they try to transition wealth from one generation to the next. As Natasha mentioned, Whittier Trust is actually the oldest and largest privately owned multifamily office and trust company headquartered on the West Coast. Starting from relatively humble origins as the family office for the Max Whittier family, Max was an early California oil entrepreneur and one of the developers of the city of Beverly Hills in the early part of the 20th century. Today, we've grown to work with almost 500 families with a staff of 200 people overseeing $17 billion in assets over a variety of asset classes. We provide investment management and consulting, fiduciary, family office, philanthropic, and real estate services. And it's my pleasure to speak with you today about some of the wealth transfer ideas that you may want to consider as you move money from one generation to the next. Natasha, if you would kindly advance the slide. So what I tell folks is, 
If you don't create an estate plan, one exists for you. The state of California has one. And it's held in our intestacy laws in the California Probate Code. Um, Natasha, you can run through those bullet points. We won't go through all of them individually. Suffice it to say, it's a pretty complicated structure, the intestacy uh, ladder, if you will, with assets going up and down the family tree, depending on the makeup of your family. What I do know for, for sure is that it rarely fits the desires of most individuals. And so it really is worth, uh, worth someone's time and trouble to do an estate plan. I want to talk a little bit uh, briefly about community property because we do live in a community property state in, in California. And having moved here from New York, I went to law school in New York and started my career there. Uh, it's very different from what are called common law states. So the main thing to know about community property is that the presumption is that all property garnered in a marriage is property of the community. So irrespective of title, uh, the, the property uh, could be community property. For example, if I have a brokerage account with my name on it and not my wife's, it still may be community property depending on the source of those funds. In common law states, the presumption is otherwise. The title is indicative of ownership. Here in California, it's community property unless you say it isn't. Now, there are two ways to change uh, something from community property or out of community property. One is called transmutation, and that is taking community property and converting it into separate property. So my wife and I, for a variety of planning reasons, might want to take our community property and make some of it her property. We would, we would do that by a transmutation. And since 1985, that transmutation needs to be done in a writing that's signed by both of us, and we both need to be fully informed. And really a best practice is to be represented by counsel. The opposite of transmutation, where you take community property and turn it into separate property, is commingling. This is much easier to do and doesn't require a writing. And this is taking separate property and either purposefully or inadvertently converting it into community property. A great example of this, when my wife and I moved here from New York with our two young children in 1996, we bought our first home in Los Angeles. We used actually separate property that was my wife's for our down payment. She stayed at home to raise our two young children and I went to work. My earnings are community property in California. We used my salary and wages to pay property taxes, mortgage payments, and things like that, commingling her separate property with, with, with the community property. Now, this really is, is only relevant in the case of divorce or death. Um, and there can be tracing to get back to the origin of that separate property in a, an inadvertent commingling, but it can be complicated and time consuming. So just I just wanted to, uh, to raise that issue. Natasha, if you could go to the next slide, please. Again, just a few more notes on, on community property because it is different than, than what happens in most of the country. So, um, oops, if you could go back, there we go. So highlighted in red, are the community property states uh, by statute. In addition, Alaska, Kentucky, and Tennessee allow spouses to elect into community property. Each state differs slightly in what they consider to be community property. In California, there's this weird thing called quasi-community property, which is property that had it been earned in California, even though it was actually earned somewhere else or garnered somewhere else, becomes community property. It gets treated like community property. Uh, one of the benefits, at least for now, uh, of living in a community property state is that the entire community gets a step up in basis on the death of one spouse. Let's talk a little bit about this. If I buy a stock for $10 a share and it's now trading at $100 a share, I have a built-in capital gain of $90 when I sell that stock. If I die with that holding that stock, my heirs actually don't have to pay that capital gains tax. The tax basis changes from $10 a share to the current fair market value on the date of my death, which would be $100 in my example. So this is a real benefit to heirs receiving property from an estate. In common law states, which is the gray or white area of that map, only the decedent's property gets a step up in basis. The definition of community property, however, is that each spouse owns an undivided one-half interest in all of the property. 
And so under current IRS rules and regulations, the entire property gets a step up in basis. From a practical standpoint, what this means is that a surviving spouse has all of the uh, basis in their property stepped up on the death of the first spouse, and it provides planning opportunities. Just a quick side note, Bloomberg reported yesterday that part of President Biden's tax plan, which he is going to be announcing later this evening, actually would do away with that step up in basis, um, which would be a big change in the way things have been done in the past and would probably result in a great uh, in, in a lot of e extra taxes being collected, which I'm sure is why he's doing it. OK, uh, Natasha, if you could flip to the next slide. So in California, um, and I think there are some bullet points at the top, Natasha, I don't know, there we go. Uh, we use something called a revocable or living trust for estate planning purposes. It's sometimes referred to as a will substitute. In common law states, this isn't really a thing. When I went to law school in New York and worked in trust companies in New York, probate is a very simple process there. You go to the court, it's, it's not super expensive. It's easy and any trusts created are usually created under a will. In fact, early in my career, I kind of thought revocable trusts were a bit of a scam. Lo and behold, move to California and find out not only is really all estate planning done in a living or revocable trust, but because of the community property nature of the state, most of these are jointly settled trusts. So husband and wife create a trust together. While you're alive, it's really a bit of a form over substance discussion. Um, however, it provides for much easier post-death administration during um, when, when the first spouse dies or the second spouse, because no one has to go to court to get court approval to do anything. Additionally, if, a, if a, one of the trustors or grantors, as they're sometimes called, becomes incapacitated, a successor trustee can step in and manage the affairs of the trust. This avoids probate, which here in California is expensive and public. Now people say, okay, well, I've got a living trust. Do I still need a will? And the answer is yes, you still need a will. Here in California, it tends to be a relatively short document, used primarily for one, appointing guardians of any minor children, and then two, transferring any assets that didn't get put in the name of the trust into the name of the trust. Now, there are certain kinds of assets that don't pass either by will or trust. Those are retirement assets, which pass by operation of law in accordance with the beneficiary designation. So when you're reviewing your estate planning from time to time, it's a good idea to do a periodic sort of financial hygiene check of your retirement accounts, 401ks, IRAs, even pension plans. The providers of those plans typically have what's called a beneficiary designation form, and you can designate one or more individuals to receive the proceeds of that plan on your death. Now, again, because this is a community property state, if you are married and you don't leave the plan assets to your spouse, uh, surviving spouse, there will need to be a waiver by your surviving spouse, in effect, as a, a kind of transmutation of those assets. The other commonly held asset that doesn't pass under the terms of a will or a trust would be life insurance. And again, life insurance would have a beneficiary designation form where you tell the life insurance company to whom they should pay the proceeds upon your death. Now in large estates or with very large policies where an estate tax might come into play, we use something called an irrevocable life insurance trust. Beyond the scope of this discussion, but certainly if you have a large and by large in today's world, I would say $10 million or more um, life insurance policy, you probably wanna to talk to your lawyer about how best to hold that. The reason is, if, it's, if, if I own a life insurance policy, if I can control who enjoys the benefit of that policy during my lifetime, and I can designate a beneficiary, then the proceeds of that are taxable in my estate when I die. If I have a taxable estate, the way to avoid that is by placing the life insurance in an irrevocable trust. Natasha, if you could forward the slide one more, please. Okay, here's a common mistake that I see folks making. We go to all the trouble of hiring a lawyer and drafting a trust, uh, but we forget to change the name on our accounts to match the name of the trust. So the trust only operates over property titled in the name of the trust. That means bank and brokerage accounts, real estate, your home, 
vacation homes, investment property, private investments and partnerships, all should be in the name of the trust. If they're not, if they're not, that will that we talked about before that can kind of pour everything into the trust may be used to do that, but it's a complicated and time consuming process. You have to go to court, uh, the executor or successor trustee would have to go to court. Um, and it's just better, it's just a better practice to have it all in the name of the trust. I also tell people this really is not a do it yourself exercise. Trust in estate litigation is a booming business. And it really is worth the time and effort to hire a knowledgeable trust and estate planning attorney, even if you don't have a taxable estate. And I've got more stories than I can count where step parents and stepchildren end up in litigation after the death of a matriarch or patriarch uh, because the trust wasn't quite buttoned up as much as it should be. Natasha, if you could flip to the next slide. All right, now that we've discussed a little bit about the ways in which assets are transferred, let's talk about how much someone can give away. The basic rule is we have a, we have we actually have a couple of different tax systems in this country, right? We've got sales taxes and property taxes. At the federal level, we have what are called income taxes. We're all familiar with that. And then transfer taxes. Transfer taxes are the gift tax, the estate tax, and then something called the generation skipping transfer tax, which we won't get into today. The basic rule is anytime I transfer property to someone else, by default, there it gives rise to a transfer tax. If I give it during my lifetime, it's a gift tax. If I give it away at death, the estate tax comes into play. Now, transfers, gifts from one spouse to another, as long as both spouses or are US citizens, are unlimited. So there's no penalty, no tax, no exemption used up in a gift from one spouse to another, assuming they're both US citizens. If the donee spouse is a non-citizen, different rules and exclusions apply. Let's talk a little bit about the gift and estate taxes. Right now, there's a lifetime exemption equal to $11.7 million per individual or $23.4 million per couple. This was enacted in the Trump tax legislation and is scheduled actually to sunset on December 31st of 2025. And it will revert back to what it was at the time that this was enacted um, in the last administration, which was $5 million adjusted for inflation. So most practitioners think it will be probably close to $6 million per person or $12 million per couple. Now there was some discussion in the lead up to today's release of Biden's tax plan that the plan might suggest lowering this to three and a half million dollars per person. What I've read again this morning, just in news reports, is that um, the, the Biden administration isn't going to make a change to the exemption. They'll just let this sunset in 2025 and instead get rid of that step up in basis. Well, what is the gift in estate tax? It's 40% of anything over the exemption amount. So that's a pretty hefty tax. And I will tell you that certain states have state estate taxes. So for example, we have clients who might be interested in moving to the state of Washington. Washington, as you may know, has no state income tax, but Washington has a state estate tax that kicks in at $2 million worth of assets and goes up to 20%. That's an addition to the federal estate tax. So California is actually an estate tax haven. Now let's talk a little bit about lifetime gifts. Uh, as we already touched on, the donee of the gift gets my basis in the gifted asset. So that stock that I bought for $10 a share, that's now worth hundred. If I gift that stock, those shares to, my, to one of my sons, he now has an inherent capital gain of $90. So for that purpose, we tell clients to resist the temptation to give low basis assets because you're really gifting less than the full fair market value um, because when, when, the, when the donee sells that property at some point in the future, they're going to have to pay the capital gains tax. Now, before we even get to any sort of taxable gift during the year, each individual can give to each donee up to $15,000 per year without triggering a gift tax and without eating into that lifetime exemption. I can give $15,000 to as many people as I want during the year as long as they have the right to control that property. 
In addition, direct payments of tuition and healthcare may be made on top of the $15,000 a year. So what we often advise grandparents to do is write the tuition check to that private school for your grandchildren directly to the school. That way you can give the $15,000 perhaps into a 529 plan for college education while at the same time making the tuition payments directly to the school, no gift tax involved. And then finally, as we mentioned, at least as the law stands today, for gifts at debt, there is a step up in basis. So no, uh, so no capital gains taxes payable by heirs. All right, let's, let's go to the next slide, Natasha. All right, not everyone wants to give away their entire estate to individuals. Many want to make gifts to charity. So here we advise clients to make it a stock gift. Again, if I have appreciated stock in my portfolio, if I sell it, I have to pay capital gains tax. And then if I gift the proceeds of that sale to a charity, you know, my deduction is going to be offset by income. On the other hand, I can give that stock directly to the charity. I get the deduction, the income tax deduction for the full fair market value of the stock. The charity can then sell it without any capital gains tax, thereby relieving me of a capital gains tax burden and giving them all of the benefit of the value. Now, we have many clients who may want to create a private foundation uh, to give away money longer term or perhaps to help give, make family gifts over time. And we can talk a little bit about it in employing a family foundation to engage younger generation family members in the gifting process. But family foundations come with a fairly hefty administrative burden they're not quite as tax efficient as a direct gift to a public charity. And there is a certain level of complexity. In fact, in California, if the private foundation has income of $2 million a year, a state audit is required. So our next best recommendation to clients is actually using something called a donor advised fund or a DAF. These are available from almost any brokerage firm or financial advisor. The Marin Community Foundation in Marin County has an excellent staff and donor advised fund platform. It's actually a public charity that you can put your name on. And while you don't have complete control, um, you, you get to recommend where the funds go over a period of time. It's much simpler and typically more effective for many families to use a donor advised fund. Um, Natasha, if you could move to the next slide, please. Let's talk quickly about transfers of real property. Here in California, because our homes are so expensive, this tends to be a major asset for many of us. We often want to give away that family vacation home in Tahoe that we've spent so many years at with children and grandchildren. I just give you, I would just give you a little, take a little pause here. Uh, this is, in my experience, one of the greatest sources for intra-family litigation. If the family's home in Tahoe is used by me living here in the Bay Area with my wife and kids and my brother who lives in upstate New York with his wife and kids, we're gonna have very different usage of that property. And I might want to make improvements that he really isn't interested in spending money on. So it, it requires some thought. Also, if you've been fortunate enough to amass commercial or rental properties as part of your estate, Think about who's going to manage those properties when you're gone. And, and does that person, does the child or grandchild have the time and expertise to do that? Finally, we would recommend, particularly with investment real estate, to consider setting it up in some sort of an entity, a limited liability company or LLC. This protects the family's assets, the rest of the family assets from any claims that might be brought by a tenant, an employee, a renter, something like that. And then units of an LLC are much easier to gift to younger generation family members or to trusts for their benefit than actually giving interests in the property. One more uh, slide, please, Natasha. Okay, one of the things that we found is that, and studies have shown, about 70% of the time, the wealth doesn't last past the third generation. And the academic work that's been done around this has proven to show that it isn't because of poor management of the assets or taxes. It typically is a lack of family communication. And so we encourage families to talk about their plan. And they don't have to tell, you don't have to tell 
your children or grandchildren about all of the asset details or values right away. But it's really important to talk about the roles and responsibilities that each person will have in a family. Frequently, we facilitate those discussions using a family values exercise. So families can sit around a table and really explore and talk about what's important to them. It might be education, it might be philanthropy, it might be building wealth for the next generation. Uh, a couple of other bullet points, fair doesn't necessarily mean equal. Um, and so different children are going to be differently situated. Just be careful about that. And again, be open and honest with your children about what you're doing and why. And then finally, if you're going to be making significant gifts to grandchildren, just make sure that, the, that your children, that their parents are aware of this and on board. I have seen situations turn out un, in unfortunate circumstances where the grandchildren were enriched and the parents really didn't have any control over their activities. One more slide, please, Natasha. Finally, we live in a digital world. We all have digital assets. So please, for the sake of your successor trustee and executor, keep a list of all of those logins, um, the banks, brokerage accounts, pension plans, crypto lockers, if you have any. If you don't leave the information there, nobody can get to that those assets um, and perhaps even social media logins. Make sure you share that, of course, keeping it in a secure place. And then the last slide, please, Natasha. Who's gonna handle all this when I die? I have many clients who've come to me and say, look, I really have a simple estate. And having administered many estates over the past 33 years, I can tell you there's no such thing as a simple estate. Again, title everything in the name of your trust. Make sure that your retirement and other operation of law designations are up to, up to date. Tell your successor trustee where all the important documents are. We would discourage you from naming just one of the children as your successor trustee or executor. This is a huge burden to place on them and just really makes them a lightning rod for sibling discontent. I can't tell you how many times, unfortunately, I've seen both parents pass away and all of the kids kind of revert to the five-year-old children around the Christmas tree fighting over toys. It happens more than you'd like to think. And then finally, Use caution when naming your surviving spouse as the sole successor trustee. Again, it's a big job. It's a big burden. And if your surviving spouse is not the parent of your children, uh, it creates a lot of tension. Is that spouse capable of stepping in? And maybe it would be better to name them as a co-trustee with a professional. Those are all of my prepared remarks for now. Susan has indicated that there are some terrific questions. And so I'd like to pause there. And Susan, let's Let's see if we can answer some of the questions. Thank you so much, Tom. I I, I do appreciate your sort of making room for this because I, you have touched on a lot of important issues and people are responding. I'd like to start with the issue of talking to your kids and your grandkids about wealth and values. I think that that really resonates. I wonder if you could expand on that. I, I'd be delighted to, Susan. I mean, this is some of the most important work that we do. All, you know, the lawyers and accountants typically drive the estate planning process through math. You know, how much can we save in taxes? And sometimes control, uh, because some of us want to control how our, our heirs behave beyond, uh, you know, from the grave. And so provisions can be written into trusts. Where I've seen this work really successfully, and I've hosted a couple of these family meetings, where, you know, you get all two or three generations in the room. And it's just magical when the oldest generation talks about you know, their beginnings, where they started, how they made the money. Um, for those of us in California, many of them tra you know, traveled either from other countries or across this country to build their lives and their fortune in California. And so really explaining to the children and even more importantly to grandchildren, all the work that went into building the estate um, and then what values the family really holds dear. A lot of times it's education and philanthropy, giving back. And then sometimes it's also, you know, continuing the legacy of building wealth for, for younger generation family um, members. There are lots of excellent qualified professionals who can help facilitate these family meetings, but I've seen it used with all kinds of artifacts from photographs, old photographs. Um, you know, it's just, a, it's, it's sharing someone's literally the family tree and family history. It's a wonderful exercise. I love that idea. Um, could you speak just a little bit about the, um, it was an issue you raised at the start and it relates to what you just said. It's the step up 
tax. Uh, and the so if somebody happened to be part of building Apple early on, and now they have a chunk of Apple stock, if they want to preserve it and pass it on and grow that incredible wealth, what? How do you do that? And oh my God, talk about what it means if if the uh, tax laws actually change, as Joe Biden's about to explain. Yeah, so that's a big issue, Susan, and and really it is hot off the press because the Biden administration sort of, um, well, it appears as they may have changed their game plan a little bit at the last minute here, because I think there was a lot of expectation that they would lower that $11.7 million exemption down to three and a half, maybe. And instead, the, even at three and a half million dollars, $7 million per couple, that doesn't touch a lot of families and the estate tax itself doesn't raise a lot of revenue. However, that step up in basis, having that capital gain disappear for heirs would capture a lot of money and could be applied to everyone, not just wealthy Americans. And so um, there are a variety of, of more sophisticated planning techniques that families could use. One of our favorites is something called a charitable remainder trust, where a family has a desire to benefit both family members and charity at the same time. It's possible to donate appreciated Apple stock in your example, Susan, to a trust that might pay, pay me and my, my spouse or the survivor of us a certain percentage every year. And at the end of that, at, at the end of our lives, whatever is left could go into our private foundation, our donor advised fund, our favorite university or hospital, wherever we'd like to have it go. By making that gift into the trust, the trustee can actually sell the Apple stock without paying a capital gains tax. Now the annuity that I get back during my lifetime is subject to income tax, but it allows the trustee to reinvest 100 cents on the dollar. Again, probably more detail than is uh, than really possible to go into here, but, but qualified planners, estate and trust planners and accountants can, um, can certainly work with families to help transfer those assets. But it looks like the step up in basis, I mean, who knows if this is going to get through Congress or if this is just the opening salvo, but it certainly has, uh, has gotten a lot of attention in the past couple of days could have dramatic effect and people really need to understand that complicated concept. Absolutely. Um, an early question was, do you also practice, adhere to fiduciary standards? Yes. So, um, so that's an excellent point. It really gets to the wealth management industry as if you will. And uh, Whittier Trust Company as a trustee, uh, it, it, we, we, we manage things in a fiduciary capacity in the best interests of our clients. Now, there are lots of wonderful financial advisors who work at brokerage firms uh, where the standard is different. Um, but, uh, but yes, that's one of the differentiators that we hold out for ourselves. So what you're saying is that the term trust, when trust is as associated with the relationship, that's a fiduciary standard that's different, uh, a higher standard than brokerage accounts. Well, yeah, I, I don't want to disparage anyone in the in, in the broader wealth management community, but there are differences. And so there are certain accounts, certain relationships that we might establish with different financial firms where suitability um, is the criteria rather than being in the best interest of the client. And so when Whittier Trust, for example, serves as a trustee or a successor trustee, we can actually be held liable for the decisions we make in court by the beneficiaries. And, you know, we're still privately owned, majority owned by the Whittier family who founded us for the purpose of being their trustee. Uh, they got to a point where they were so big, they didn't want cousins being trustee for one another. They felt like there would be too many conflicts there. And so they built this, this solution for their family. And we now, you know, they now share it with other families. So that does make us a little bit different. Excellent. Um, Susan Benson said that she is single with three adult children. Her house is in a revocable trust and she has a will with all three children as the beneficiaries. Her children are the beneficiaries of all of her financial accounts too, uh, 401k, annuities, IRA, stock accounts, etc. Does she need a revocable trust for the monies in the non-house financial accounts? Yes, I would still recommend that um, that anyone in California use a revocable trust. 
Um, in a typical brokerage account, uh, there isn't a pay on death. Um, you can you can set up a, a bank account, for example, that says pay on death to you know my children, for example. But typically in a brokerage account, that's going to fall into your probate estate. And again, here in California, that process is expensive. It's time consuming. You have to go to court and it's complicated. So the preferred practice here is to use a revocable or living trust. And there are some great lawyers in Marin County who can help folks do this. It's not terribly expensive. And the money that you spend now on setting this up will save your children, your heirs, uh, great time and money um, on the back end when you're no, no longer around. That's a huge piece of advice. Thank you so much. Um, Gail asked a couple of things. How is a revocable trust used in conjunction to work with a pour over will? And also how is an SNT handled with a revocable trust? Uh, so the, um, the pour over will is really what I was talking about earlier. If for example, I forget to title something in the name of my trust, the pour over will allows an executor to transfer that property to the trust and then allow the trustee to handle it. So it's a, basically a provision of every California will that I've seen. And they, again, we recommend typically that clients visit with their estate planning attorneys probably every three to five years if there's a big change in circumstances, death, divorce, birth, marriage, uh, change in tax laws, those kinds of things would prompt uh, change. I will tell you because of the impending, uh, the potential for tax law changes this year, we expect many estate planning attorneys to get very, very busy and perhaps stop taking clients. And so if you think you it's time for a, a, an estate plan hygiene checkup, I would say run, don't walk to your estate planning lawyer now, get on their list now. Uh, so you've got their time and attention rather than waiting until November or December when they may not have the time to, to, to talk with you. I'm right. not exactly sure I understand, sorry, uh, Susan, the, the second part of that question um, so I may um, I may punt on that if that's okay. So the question was an SNT. Uh, do you know what an SNT is? I'm not uh, special needs trust, perhaps. Uh, okay. If that if if I have that correctly, that's typically an irrevocable trust that is set up for the benefit of a family member who might not be able to take care of their own financial affairs, might be suffering from some sort of a disability, whether it's a permanent disability or perhaps a recurring disability. Um, those trusts are set up so that they um, will supplement any government aid that the, that the beneficiary might otherwise qualify for. Those are highly specialized. And there, I would recommend if you have a special needs family member, I would go to an attorney who specializes in special needs trusts. It's a, it is a subspecialty. Great advice. Thank you. Um, what... Uh, are the rules, sorry, are the rules the same for non-U.S. citizens if they are, it must mean that they are leave, they're living in the United States, if they are leaving assets to heirs outside of the United States? Oh boy. So um, there's a whole other set of rules and regulations that apply to, um, to both non-citizen spouses, whether they're residents or non-residents, and then uh, non-resident beneficiaries. And again, there are attorneys who specialize in cross-border estate planning. As you can imagine, the United States has tax treaties with countries around the world, and everyone is completely different. So a lot depends on where that beneficiary lives. Certain countries, for example, in Europe are called civil law countries. They don't, some of them don't even recognize trusts. Um, and the, the the planning, the tax planning around that is, is really beyond the scope of uh, uh, of this discussion, Susan, I would really just have someone go to a specialist. I will tell you that, you know, we, I mentioned briefly that transfers from one spouse to another, as long as both spouses are citizens, um, are unlimited. It, that does not apply if the spouse receiving the gift, even if they're a permanent resident, if they're a non-citizen spouse, there are limits on how much you can give. And even when you leave money in trust for that spouse, those trusts have to be specially qualified. So again, it's a really important thing um, to tell um, to tell your estate planning lawyer that a sp one of the spouses is not a citizen. So I want to follow up on that because I have a son who's married to a Japanese 
national. She's not yet an American citizen. Does that mean that the law will be different for him than it would be for his siblings who are all married to Americans? It, it absolutely does, Susan. And, and his ability to transfer unlimited amounts of money, either during life or at death, to his non-citizen spouse will be limited. The basic idea, if you think about it, I'll step back 30,000 feet for a moment, is the tax really applies on the death, the estate tax applies on the death of the second spouse. So when the first spouse dies, if everything goes either directly to or in a trust for the benefit of the surviving spouse, no estate taxes do. And the idea there is that the government doesn't want to impoverish the surviving spouse by taxing the estate and then having to supplement the surviving spouse. So the surviving, it's really the tax comes into play on the death of the second spouse. The concern that the government has with a non-citizen spouse is if you have the citizen spouse die first, all of the assets go to the non-citizen spouse. If they can then leave the country and go back to their home country, taking the assets with them, it escapes taxation in the United States. Um, and so the government wants to make sure they get their 40% of whatever they are entitled to. Um, and so the rules are designed to keep that in place. All right, thank you. You helped me today. Uh, <laughs> is it advisable to use an estate planning attorney to set up a biblical trust? Absolutely. Uh, again, this is not something that, um, as, as terrific as some of the web, you know, we all think, I, I know at my house, you know, we, somebody sneezes and we all go run to Google to figure out what, you know, what sort of disease we have. Um, and so our temptation in this day and age is to, is to do a lot of things ourselves, but this is really not something you can just look up on YouTube. And, and in fact, I have read documents that very, very smart clients, doctors, business executives have tried to write for themselves and I'll give you one example. A gentleman came to my office with his wife. They've been married a very long time, but second spouse, second marriage for both of them. They, they each had two children from their prior marriage and the um, couple had done their own trust. And on the first page, paragraphs one and three contradicted each other completely. Um, and, and the result of that would be a lawsuit among the kids. Uh, on, the on the death of the second spouse. And so it, it just isn't worth it. It's, it's, it, it, it. This can be done relatively inexpensively. It's absolutely worth the time, trouble, and expense of, of hiring a trust lawyer. Great advice. Thank you. Um, you talked about an earlier issue that I'd love for you to expand on too, and that's the second home issue. It, how? Where have you seen, if, if, the first generation wants to transfer the uh, second home to the next generation or to the grant, the third generation. Some want it, some don't. What, what are the strategies to use? Yeah, so there are a couple of different strategies. There's an excellent um, tax planning strategy called a Qualified Personal Residence Trust, otherwise known, we love acronyms, uh, called a QPERT, uh, which allows you to uh, at some point in the future, transfer the value of a, of a personal residence to either trust for children or outright to children and grandchildren. The, 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 my, my first best advice is if you think that there are one or two kids who want it, give it to them and give an equal amount of other assets to other children. Um, or provide enough funds so that one child can buy out the other child's interest. Uh, it's just not worth it in the end. If, you, if you're insistent that this compound stay in the family for generations, create an entity, create a trust or an LLC or perhaps even both, fund it with enough money to provide property taxes, insurance payments, you know, repairs, things like that, so that the future generations aren't sort of fighting over this. And again, I've seen this at all wealth levels from a you know, relatively simple and expensive home on the Russian River to you know, multi-million dollar homes in Tahoe. Um, you know, the, the courts are filled with litigation over this stuff. And, and you can just imagine, it isn't even necessarily the kids that may fight over this, it's their spouses. Um, and it's just, you know, and the further separated the family gets, the harder and harder it is. So endowing an entity to keep this, to maintain it, maybe setting rules, guidelines about who can use it, some sort of governance. There was that um, great uh, George Clooney movie about the family in Hawaii 
I can't remember the name of it now. Uh, but that, you know, that's very true to life. Those kinds of things are very true to life. Um, to talk a little bit more about that, if you're going to set up a fund or, or a trust to endow it, and again, if you put in uh, uh, assets that are like Apple stock that then balloon, can you can you limit it in some way? Because you know, I can imagine some. I, I put in five hundred thousand dollars of Apple stock, and now it's worth twenty million. And the family's now saying, "Wait, wait, we don't need twenty million to you know maintain that little that little house in the Sierras." Yeah. So one of the tricks, Susan, and, and this is really difficult to, to do with folks who may be at a startup, for example. So we have a we have these discussions with a lot of folks here in the Bay Area because of the technology and and the prevalence of startup companies here. If you're it, w once you set up a trust for the benefit of someone else, it's irrevocable. Mm -hmm. And so the terms and the money that you put into it are very, very hard to change. Now, one of the things we talk to clients about is not only asset allocation on the investment side, right? How much of your money is in stocks and bonds and real estate and things like that, but asset location. So where do you put these assets? And I would say, um, and so there are certain states, Nevada is one, and Whittier has a Nevada trust company that we use for clients, where the trust laws are much more flexible than they are in California. And trust terms can be changed um, to suit different situations. And so if that property is in Tahoe, and if you're lucky enough to have it in Incline, uh, rather than in Truckee, um, then you might uh, you might want to consider using a Nevada irrevocable trust, which would give you more flexibility. But we always say, you know, when we're sitting down and planning with folks, we say, okay, what do you need? The generation that made the wealth, what do you need to live in? Let's make sure we keep that available to you. And then let's talk about what to give away and what assets are the best to give away and how you want to do that. What form do you want that to take? And then finally, where should that entity be located? Okay, thank you. Another important question. This woman does not have children and her common assets are jointly owned, J-T-W-R-O-S for the yes. house. Do we have to worry about basis cost of these assets if one of us passes away? So J-T-W-R-O-S is joint with rights of survivorship. I'm assuming by the question that the, uh, that the questioner is not married. Um, if, if they're married, remember what I said about community property, it doesn't really matter how it's titled. The presumption in a marriage is that all property is property of the community, in which case the surviving spouse would receive it. Um, there is uh, in a joint, that's a good question. If you're not married and you hold it with joint with rights of survivorship, only the decedent's share would get the step up in basis, not the entire asset. Okay, there's another great question. If you want to leave most of your estate to an environmental organization, makes sense in this era, and, but you think, hope that you will still live many years, what is the best way to do this? Oh, great question, Susan. And that kind of gets back to the technique that I talked about earlier, which is this charitable remainder trust. And it can function as a private annuity for someone. So I donate appreciated property into an irrevocable trust. The terms of that trust may say that the trustee pays me 6% a year for as long as I live. If I'm married, it can pay the survivor of me and my spouse. And then on the death, if it's just for me on my death, or if it's for me and my spouse on my spouse's death, or the second death, uh, then whatever is left could go to the Nature Conservancy or whomever you'd like. Um, that's a wonderful way to provide a steady income stream during life while making sure that the charity or charities of your choice get the benefit after you're no longer around. Um, so it's, and, and, and what I love about this technique is that there's, there's no IRS risk here, right? These rules are written into the Internal Revenue Code. They've been around for 50 years. It's not um, some slick technique uh, that was just thought up that's trying to skirt a rule. It's very, very clear. Most estate planning lawyers will be familiar with this and be able to help someone implement it. Sometimes the actual charity, particularly large charities, can even serve as the trustee uh, of the trust if they're going to be the ultimate beneficiaries. 
So there are a lot of options with charitable remainder trusts, and, and, and we like them for a variety of reasons. So Helen, who asked the question about the home and she has no children, wants us to know that she's very proud to have been married for over 30 years. Ah, well, then in that case, there would be, it's probably community property and it would get a full step up in basis. And Helen, we're sorry that we made a wrong assumption. Um, the questions are coming fast and furiously. I've missed one by um, Helen Abe, and so here it is. She has an LLC for her real estate at death. Will it be a probate case? And what does she do instead to avoid it being in probate? That is a great question. Um, and so the LLC ideally should be held in her living or revocable trust. So um, Helen, you should run to your estate planning lawyer if you don't have a living trust and make sure that that LLC is actually owned by the trust, not by you individually. And that will make sure that it avoids probate. Okay, oh, I got it wrong again. April, I'm so sorry. It wasn't Helen. Helen was the one whose question I missed. April was the one who's been married over 30 years. I'm, uh, okay. doing, I'm doing my best here. And it's because Tom's doing such a great presentation that the questions are coming fast and furiously. Um, Crystal says, oh, she asks, what do you charge? Uh, that's a great oh, question. Please. Yeah, so most trustees, most corporate trustees, like Whittier Trust, charge a percentage on the assets under supervision, under management of the trust. And I'd be happy to discuss that with anyone um, offline uh, to, to, to discuss their specific situation. Yeah, so I think that the difference here is that when assets are held in trust, it's the you have a higher duty of care. So the fees held in trust are generally greater than just brokerage account fees. Is that correct? Typically, although sometimes, uh, depending on what the brokerage fees are and what you're paying for investment management, there's not a huge premium in the market for serving as a trustee. Um, you know, the reason we like to serve as a trustee, well, I mean, we were set up to be a trustee. That's why we exist. Um, the reason we do it for other clients is because from a business standpoint, then we have those assets, if you will, after the first generation passes away. Typically in a brokerage situation, once the wealth earner or that account holder passes away, the heirs change to their financial advisor. And so there tends to be a lot of turnover in a death situation. Um, when you're the trustee, you keep those assets, uh, if you will. Uh, so there's a trade-off there. But you're right, Susan, the responsibility is greater, right? We are responsible for the taxes and the upkeep and the all any sort of filings and reporting to the beneficiaries and all of those kinds of things. You also started and touched on during our presentation the working with the families and listening to the stories and facilitating those conversations. And I see that as invaluable. Well, it's true, right? I mean, I can't I can't tell you, Susan, and we probably all know situations where, you know, mom and dad worked worked their fingers to the bone to build an estate. Again, you know, we, we particularly see this in folks who are now in their you know, maybe 70s, 80s, and 90s here in California. They moved here when real estate was, you know, truly affordable and, you know, have really benefited uh, from, of course, if they were good business people, really have benefited from the growth of the state and the growth of asset prices over time. And, um, and, and, and you know, they may have amassed more than they thought they were going to. And then, you know, what, none, what really nobody wants, right, is to have children or grandchildren waiting by the mailbox for a check every month from a trustee. Um, and, you know, I have seen tragic stories of family members who received money either too young or without any training, and the money got wasted. And even more importantly, sometimes the lives get wasted, right? People don't reach their full potential. And so, you know, there are all sorts of, of ways to broach this conversation. It really has to be individualized for each family and sometimes for each family member. At Whittier Trust, we sort of stack our teams, if you will. I might work with the older generation of the family and my 30 year old colleagues might work with their children or grandchildren. So they feel like there's someone their age kind of going through the same life events that they are. Um, they feel more comfortable asking questions. And so um, and so that's a really, you know, getting to know the family and getting to know their individual situation is really critical to providing that advice. And again, I think sharing family values 
can help the younger generation family members so much. Because, you know, when you grow up in a house and your parents go off to work every day and are working really hard, you see that, right? The grandchildren are one step removed from that process. So they may not know how hard grandma and grandpa worked to, to, to build that fortune. And so providing them that education and that background in history is a true gift. Couldn't agree more. Uh, John wants to know, he has gold coins in his possession. Uh, he will leave it to his kids. How will the government value these coins? And if there is no, if there is no record of what he paid for them? Yeah, you know what? That is an excellent question. Um, so what happens when when someone dies is a valuation of all the assets is done as of the date of death. And so with things like coins, uh, collectibles, you know, there are valuation experts for all of this. So, for example, in cases where Whittier serves as the executor and successor trustee, we, depending on the type of collection it is, we would probably hire an auction house to come in and give us an estimate of their value. There are different valuation rules, and we don't really have time to get into all of that in the estate tax uh, process. But what someone paid for it is actually irrelevant as to the value on their date of death, right? It's really... Um, it's really what they're worth when you die. And because we still have this step up in basis, you almost don't have to worry about keeping track of that tax cost. All right. Um, how much How much do fiduciaries charge? <laughs> Again, um, it's really, a, it, 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 it runs the gamut and I prefer not to get into specifics here. Uh, be happy to answer those questions offline. Okay, great. Uh, and uh, not all fiduciaries are created equal, is my guess. So that's true. And there are there are institutional trustees like Whittier Trusts, banks, and trust companies. There are individual fiduciaries. So there are individuals who are licensed by the state of California to serve as a trustee. And sometimes that's an excellent choice for a family. It really depends on the nature of the assets, the size of the estate, uh, the complexity involved. You know, we're serving as successor trust, trustee right now in, a, in an estate with. 20 different pieces of real property in San Francisco. And it came with, you know, commercial property and residential property and apartment buildings and a staff of nine. There were nine employees as part of this trust. So there's a high degree of complexity there. Most individuals would, would have a hard time taking that on and managing it. Um, you know, I have tons of colleagues who can help me with that. Um, so the... April asked a really good question, and I think I know the answer, but she says, what does valuation of all assets mean if you don't have a massive estate? Because yeah. if, if it's under 11.7 or whatever it is million, we don't have to worry so much, right? Well, you still, you, there still may be things that you want to take advantage of by filing an estate tax return, but typically the values would need to be set. Um, and it can be done, you know, relatively simply. Um, and again, bringing in outside experts for, our, for if, you know, if it's a brokerage account, those assets are easy to, to value on date of death. Um, if it's a home, getting a local real estate broker to provide a broker's opinion of value might be sufficient for that purpose. You know, if you're not filing an estate tax return, again, under current law, the main reason you want a good valuation is to set that tax basis. So if you've lived in your home for 40 years and you know that it's appreciated, and you want to make sure your kids um, get your your tax basis in that. I'm not talking about property taxes. That's a whole different area that just changed in California. We absolutely don't have time to talk about that. Uh, you're going to want a valuation to make sure that your heirs get the, the the income tax basis set properly. Okay, here's another question. Trying to really understand about Whittier Trust. What better question might be? What range wealth does your company best serve? Sure. So Whittier Trust works with families who have $10 million or more to invest. Uh, our client sizes range from you know, $10 million to over a billion dollars uh, and everything in between. Thank you so much. And there are still more questions. We'll have to find another time to talk and keep it going. Well, Susan and Natasha, I can't thank you Better Media Group and Marin Magazine enough for allowing me the, the opportunity to speak with you and your audience today. I really thank everyone for, for tuning in. Thank you thank so you much, Mom.
Yeah, that is all the time we have for today, unfortunately. But we are so grateful that you were all able to join us. Uh, thanks again to Tom and Susan for making this such a great event. And a big thank you to everyone that attended and participated in our discussion. That was awesome. Uh, we would love to stay connected with you. So please subscribe to our Better Letter and follow us on our social media accounts. I'm going to send out a recording of this event tomorrow, along with the resources you need to stay connected with us all. And if you're watching this as a recording on YouTube, please subscribe to our channel. We upload new content regularly. Once again, thank you so much for joining us, and I wish you all a wonderful rest of your week. Bye -bye.